Hi everyone, my name is Sean and welcome to another episode of Lines in Sand. Today I present to you the long promised deep dive video on the Giza power plant theory as proposed by Christopher Dunn and published in his book of the same name back in 1998. The book will be the focus of this video as we dive into the pages and dissect everything that Dunn proposes and really properly examine the theory and the evidence which he presents in support. If you've not seen one of these deep dive videos before, we'll start with a brief overview of what the theory covers before hitting the gritty technical details which will take up the main bulk of the video. At the end, we'll take a look at some of the theory's main detractors, if there are any, and address any counter evidence that has been put forward against the theory over the years. At the end, I'll offer my own thoughts on everything we have discovered before the video closes. If this kind of in-depth analysis is something you are interested in, then please feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. I really do appreciate that kind of thing. This is going to be a long one, so I've tried to be more granular with the chapter segments than I usually am in regards to these deep dives. So feel free to dip in and out and, you know, stop and start whenever you please. So with that out of the way, and without any further ado, let's get started. What then is the Giza power plant theory? The Giza power plant theory is a theory that crystallized in the late 90s after many years of research, resulting in the book of the same name, minus the word theory, which was published in 1998. Chris Dunn, a machinist and engineer, writes in detail about ancient building techniques, how what we may accept as the truth about the history of building in ancient Egypt is perhaps not strictly true. As we will cover in this video, Dunn became convinced that the ancients had the power to use machine tools whilst constructing their megaliths and working with impossibly difficult materials such as quartz-rich granite. This work examines the evidence for the use of such tools, but then goes a step further and asks, if the ancient Egyptians could use machine tools, then what was the power source for such devices? Chris Dunn's website explains that this book is about, quote, an holistic energy device that is harmonically coupled with the earth and its inhabitants. Pulling in for a lower view of the theory, Dunn proposes a source of tappable energy, how the pyramid connects to such a source, and perhaps most importantly, theorizes how such an energy source was harnessed and transformed via a series of chambers and apparatus that worked together in delicate unison to turn that raw energy into consumable power. If that sounds interesting to you, then I do ask you to stick with me as this video goes to places that I have not gone before on this channel. It's been a lot of fun getting out of my comfort zone and I ask that you do the same. So then, what did I learn from reading Chris Dunn's The Giza Power Plant? The Giza Power Plant is a fantastic book to look at. It comes from an era of paperbacks that we just simply are not in anymore. Imagine seeing something like this on the shelf at your local bookstore. You just wouldn't these days. My father's attic is full of books on alternative history, the supernatural, and other alternative spiritual hot takes, and they all have covers that more or less look like this. It's fantastic, and I hope that it never gets repressed with a modern cover because this one's just too good. Recently, I watched a YouTube video of Christopher Dunn giving a live talk, and someone actually questions him about the accuracy of the cover painting, calling out the dimensions of the pyramid as being incorrect and too steep, which was pretty funny, to be fair. But enough of that, let's get into this thing. Dunn prefaces the chapters of his book with an introductory prelude, and in the first paragraph alone there is talk of not only a highly advanced civilization that came before us, but also a cataclysmic force that brought such advanced civilization to its end. I had to check for a moment that I hadn't accidentally picked up a book by Graham Hancock, but Dunn immediately asks the question that Hancock does not. Where is the infrastructure to support such a high civilization? How was this culture sustained? Where are their power lines? Where are their power plants? 
Dan wastes no time in admitting that we should look no further than the Great Pyramid for the possible answer to this question. The author then boldly states that the Great Pyramid tomb theory is not a theory that is supported by any evidence. A bold claim indeed, but another quickly follows. In case you were still perhaps confused about what book you may be reading, Dunn states that the structure that we call the Great Pyramid is actually a machine of great technological advancement. Dunn goes on to explain that whilst he understands why those who are perhaps reluctant to let go of the established tomb theory may assign a dual purpose to the pyramid, his lifetime of engineering, looking at plans and blueprints, caused him to look at the Great Pyramid too in a different light. Dunn writes that he, quote, could not find logical resemblance to any feature one would find in a building constructed for human activity. End quote. He rounds out his prologue by stating that no single discipline is capable of analysing and presenting the entire truth regarding the Great Pyramid. It requires experts from many different fields, and Egyptology is only one of them. Now, this is a weird thing to put into a paragraph that is closing up a prologue to a complete total overview of the Great Pyramid, its design, function, and the tools that were potentially used to build it. But what I think Dunn is trying to say here is that Egyptologists are often afraid to, or do not want to, look outside of the box, as it were. And I'm not saying that in all cases that is exactly true, that there is a dogmatic nature at the core of the field which has absolutely stagnated the investigation of its subject matter. You don't have to have me or Chris Dunn to tell you that. If you're even half invested in the world of ancient Egypt, then you will know this to be true. Chapter 1, then, of the Giza power plant hammers this point home in its opening section, where Dunn states that, quote, most information related to ancient Egypt has been in the control of Egyptologists. He writes, then, of a tide of alternative thinkers who are bucking this trend and treading the ground in Egypt with Edgar Case, Dr. Joseph Shaw, and Tom Danley all getting a mention. I am a bit surprised that Robert Boval and Graham Hancock don't get a mention yet, but Tom Donnelly's acoustic tests we'll come back to a little later in this video. But this is the part of the book where Dunn first addresses the potential for clandestine digging operations having taken place secretly inside the Great Pyramid. I have a recent video all about this eyewitness report from Tom Danley, the aftermath and the evidence for whether it happened or not, which I will link below if you're interested. Not long after addressing the hold that mainstream Egyptology has over the ancient world, Dunn lists several more fringe theories, I suppose to try and strike a balance where his own theory comes out in the middle of both, bridging the gap between practical functionality and esoteric fringe thinking, much like the sensible core idea of Dunn's own work itself. Before you get to the resonator halls and pouring chemicals down pyramid shafts and all that good stuff, but as usual... I'm getting ahead of myself. It's not long before Dunn argues that the circumstances of Howard Weiss's discovery of the Khufu work gang cartouche is a little bit suspicious. He stops short here of actually accusing Weiss of forgery, but the intentionality is plain to see, I think. There was abundant intentionality. I could be reading too much into this, but Dunn is not wrong here. The circumstances around Weiss's discovery are indeed a little bit sketchy, as is the similar but less talked about discovery of an iron plate in one of the Great Pyramid's shafts, also by Weiss or one of his men. I also have a video on this mystery too, and I will link that below if you are so inclined to want to watch it. Dunn reiterates his belief that no bodies, or quote, no original burial, end quote, has been found in the pyramids, any pyramids for that matter, which isn't strictly true, or is at least debatable. He quotes Mark Lehner here, interestingly, in this regard. He also quotes William Fix as saying, if only a few intact burials had been discovered, it would be easier to accept grave robbery as the fate of the others. But without so much as a single original burial, the tomb theory seems to have a large hole in it. Why would thieves seeking gold and jewels also take the corpses? He also rightly addresses that some of the tombs were found with intact supposed sarcophagi, yet when broken open, no bodies were found inside them. 
Several more common theories around the pyramid are addressed here, seen as misconceptions by Dunn. He addresses commonly parroted information about the so-called star or air shaft, about the cracks in the king's chamber being caused by earthquakes, about the purposes of the so-called trial passages outside the Great Pyramid. And also Rudolf Gantenbrink's discovery of the door at the end of the southern queen's chamber shaft. This is spoken about, however, in a much more positive light, as it will absolutely come back into play a bit later on. Regarding the subjects I have just mentioned, how Dunn addresses them here is not a part of the core theory about the Giza power plant. So aside from the mention I have just given them, I will not be mentioning his interpretation of all of these individual elements, as any relevant evidence for what each portion of the pyramid's internal structure, well, that's supposed to be addressed in more detail in the meat of the theory itself, right? I've attached a link to Dunn's book in the description, however, and you are free to dive into these a bit deeper by visiting the Internet Archive Library and having a read yourself. But for now, let's move on, as time will no doubt out to get away from us as it always does. Chapter 2 continues much in the same way, addressing Al Mamun and other historical accounts of the Great Pyramid. We address the explorers of times past, such as Weiss, Cavillia, Davison, and Petrie. Dunn expresses great respect, in particular, for the work and writing of Flinders Petrie, with whom he shares a kinship due to Petrie's sharp observations and engineering like mind. As with the end of chapter 1, Dunn returns to analysing parts of the Great Pyramid. This time, great amount of time is given to the well shaft, and how he does not believe in the various creation cases and use cases put forward by various people inside and outside of Egyptology. Everything from the well shaft's construction, its rediscovery, its grotto, and even the granite found inside it is analysed here. I've already covered all of this in my Pyramid Shafts and Wells video where we went through part 2 of Keith Hamilton's Layman's Guide in great detail. I will link that below too if you're interested in the subject. The Well Shaft, after all, is a very perplexing part of the Great Pyramid. The same treatment is given for the antechamber and relieving chambers around the king's chamber. I will omit a great study of these components too in a historical context because we've gone through these chambers multiple times already on the channel. I'm far more interested in Dunn's own theories around the purposes of these constructions and we will of course get to that as we delve further into the book. What does need to be addressed however is the so-called air shafts. Now, most focus on the shafts tends to go towards the ones that are in the Queen's chamber. They are far more mysterious, having been blocked up, and of course, ending with the famous door-like blocking stones. How can one not be intrigued by the meaning of such bizarre creations? In comparison, the King's chamber shafts are far simpler on paper. They are, whatever their purpose, working shafts. They connect the King's chamber to the exterior of the pyramid. Dunn sees it as important to impart an account from Vice and Pering, where a stone shot from one of the shafts, nearly taking poor Pering's head off. I'm not sure how much of this is spiced up for the purpose of telling a story. I'd imagine a heavy stone trundling down the shaft from the outside all the way to the king's chamber would indeed build up a considerable amount of force behind it. Dunn mentions this anecdote, however, because of the discovery the two men made after the stone had come trundling down and opened the channel, allowing air into the king's chamber. Dunn writes, It is reported that with the clearing of the shafts to the king's chamber, the chamber maintained a constant temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit, no matter what the weather or temperature was outside. What was the purpose of this? Dunn asks in so many words. The dead have no need for ventilation. So in the tomb theory, the shafts instead are proposed to have mantled some sort of ritualistic or religious function, such as the symbolic journeying to the afterlife in regards to the soul or spirit of the pharaoh. Particular focus is given here on the King's Chamber Southern Shaft, however, more so in regards to its peculiar shape. Nowadays, a fan sits in the mouth of the shaft, which, despite Gantenbrink's great efforts at maintaining the interior of the pyramid with this act, is a bit of a shame as it prevents the shaft from ever really being explored again, at least from within the King's Chamber. 
It is in chapter 3 of the book then where Dunn reveals that he started to form his own true opinions on the function of the Great Pyramid, unsatisfied by the answers from Egyptology, and on top of this he notes that those involved in studying, and let's be honest, perhaps even gatekeeping the history of the pyramid, these are researchers, not craftspeople like those who built the structure in the first place. Dunn then, having such experience, believed he could shed a totally different light onto the pyramid, and shed such a light he would. The third chapter, Precision Unparalleled, talks about the incredible standards of precision that were used in the creation of the pyramid. Using the original casing stones, and reflecting on figures obtained by Flinders Petrie, Dunn gives the following example. To manufacture just two blocks with a tolerance of 0.010 inches and place them together with a gap of no more than 0.020 inches is a remarkable feat. To manufacture and position over 100,000 similar blocks required an industry that the ancient Egyptians are not credited with having developed. He goes on to write that these blocks vary between 16 and 20 tons each and are bonded together with a type of cement that was so firmly held that it was stronger than the blocks themselves. Dunn is quick to point out that, quote, here was a prehistoric monument that was constructed with such precision that you could not find a comparable modern building. The author then raises the everlasting question of why did the builders of the pyramid find it necessary to maintain such incredibly high standards of precision. Dan then makes a very, very good point. Quote, There is a great difference between knowing what point not ten of an inch from an abstract academic viewpoint is and understanding what point not ten of an inch is from a hands-on practical experience. I apologize if I've got those measurements a bit muddled up, as in my pronunciation of them. I am not a machinist. I admittedly fall into the former category as well, probably quite obviously, as do no doubt a large number of those people who have researched the Great Pyramid, including, as well, no doubt, a large number of you that are watching this video right now. The author here addresses the various attempts in modern times to build scale pyramids. First of all, we touch on the work of Mark Lehner, whose scale pyramid construction is captured in the documentary entitled This Old Pyramid. The team hit several issues and resorted to using steel tools and a front-end loader in constructing their pyramid. Visiting a limestone quarry in Bedford, Indiana, Dunn spoke with stoneworker Tom Adams. In this modern-day limestone quarry, Adams worked with a tolerance of around a quarter of an inch when cutting and dressing limestone blocks. This is a significantly greater tolerance than the 0.010 of an inch attributed to the blocks of the Great Pyramid we just looked at in the previous example. As a percentage, Dunn works out that the ancient Egyptians were working with a precise tolerance that was only 4% of the modern day equivalent. Hopefully this will give you some sense of scale as to how precise and accurate the Great Pyramid stoneworking is. To strengthen this point, Dunn visited the civil engineer Ronald Dove, who confirmed that in modern building foundations a tolerance of 0.2 of an inch is acceptable. This is slightly less than the quarter of an inch tolerance accepted by the previous stone worker, but the point is there to be made. So on top of the already asked why, Dunn now also raises the equally mind-boggling question of how. At this point Dunn turns his attention to how the Great Pyramid was levelled at its base. We addressed this in the building timeline in the channel's deep dive into the internal ramp theory. A brief recap is that Egyptologists proposed that trenches of water were used, kind of as a giant spirit level, in order to get the initial flat surface upon which to build the Great Pyramid. Dunn suggests that there is no evidence to support this theory put forward by Egyptology, and even suggests some flaws with it, that being that the Great Pyramid was built around an existing knoll. Dunn states that proponents of this levelling theory often exclude this information when talking about these trenches. Personally, I don't think that the pre-existing knoll is a deal-breaker. There, of course, would have had to have been some adjustments made to accommodate it, but I do not feel that its presence writes off this levelling theory completely. 
Dunn addresses further concerns around the evaporation of the water poured into the trenches, as well as its absorption into the ground, which are indeed fair points to be raised, I believe. These are all elements that would need to be managed, but again, in my opinion, do not debunk the trench theory. Dunn briefly mentions a separate theory proposed by the prolific Mark Lehner, who suggested that a series of holes found in the pavement of the Great Pyramid could have held sticks, which were used to measure out and level off the base. Dunn dismisses this theory as not being accurate enough for the sheer levels of precision that was taken into the account within the construction of the Great Pyramid. I am inclined to agree. Instead, he quotes from Petrie in his esteemed work, The Pyramids and Temples of Giza. Quote, at El Bersha, there is still a larger example, where a platform of limestone rock has been dressed down by cutting it away with tube drills about 18 inches in diameter. The circular grooves occasionally intersecting prove that it was done merely to remove the rock. Dunn takes this as an indication that the ancient Egyptians did not use hard manual labour and small tools, as is dictated by the history books, but instead had a degree of knowledge in the deployment of and use of high-precision machine tools. Chapter 4 of the book covers this in much more detail, but before we get there, we address one of the more famous, repeated claims about the Great Pyramid, and that is the angle at which it was erected, where the angles of its sides equate to the ratio of pi, or 3.14, and on and on and on and on and on. Surprisingly, Dunn takes little stocking this writing, it may be stretching the truth a little to say that the Great Pyramid had this exact angle, or that it was the builder's expressed intention to have a structure that exhibited this mathematical constant. Still, it was certainly close. He doesn't go as far as completely dismissing the importance of this, however, as soon after he writes, Although the incorporation of pi into the shape of the Great Pyramid has been attributed by some to be pure chance, the fact that such an angle was discovered in the casing stones suggests that the builders were at least knowledgeable in the sciences of mathematics, trigonometry, and geometry. Dunn then puts forward a quote that I liked so much that I placed it at the start of this video. This precision reveals more about the true nature of its builders than any inscription or cartouche. He is referring here to the wider pyramid rather than the Pi situation, but it's a great point nonetheless. Recapping on the presence of such precision then, Dunn writes that the building simply must have required this extremely precise dimension, proportion and mass. He writes, the builders of the Great Pyramid were highly evolved in their building skills and possessed greatly advanced instruments and tools. The accuracy of the Great Pyramid was normal to them, and perhaps their tools were not capable of producing anything less than supreme accuracy, which has astounded many over the years. Moving on to chapter 4, we get into the meat of Dunn's theories about the presence of advanced machining in ancient Egypt. Truly, the Giza power plant book is split, really, into three parts. The first is this section on the existence of super-advanced precision tooling. This expands on an earlier paper that Christopher Dunn had written and published in Analog Magazine in 1984, here fleshed out much more to set up the second part of the book, that being the hypothesis that the Great Pyramid of Egypt is actually a power station of some kind. The third part of the book, which Dan actually warns us in advance of, is the speculative part of the book about how the energy generated by the Great Pyramid power plant could be distributed and utilised. This third section goes way out there uh, into the edges of the fringe, talking about ancient Egyptian satellites, the possibility of an ancient nuclear holocaust. Thankfully, it's more of a series of appendices than a section that I need to include in order to do the power plant theory any justice, because otherwise this video would be about four hours long. As always, if there is a demand for me to further analyse these theories, I will return to them. But for now, let's rein it back in and look at some good old fashioned advanced machining. When I listen to any of Dunn's talks online, or when I initially read through this book in preparation for this video essay, the stuff about machining and precision tooling is where Chris Dunn really grabs me. 
When talking about cutting granite, Christopher Dunn recounts of a trip to Egypt where he was told that ancient Egyptians used a method where they would cut small slots into the stone, force in wooden wedges, and then soak the wedges, causing them to expand and split the rock. Now, I'm no stone worker, but I cannot imagine wet wood being able to split granite under any pressure, but perhaps that's just me. To further his research, Dunn travelled to the quarries of Aswan, where he immediately decided that there was more going on here than what Egyptologists proposed. Here is an account of what Dunn saw that led to him believing that advanced tooling was used by the ancient Egyptians during the construction of the pyramid. As for the stone left at Aswan, Located in the channel, which runs the length of an estimated 3,000 ton obelisk, I saw a large conical hole drilled into the bedrock hillside that measures approximately 12 inches in diameter and 3 feet deep. The hole was drilled at an angle, with the top intruding into the channel space. On his return to Giza, he observed an abundance of similar quarry marks on stray stone around the Second Pyramid, attributed to Pharaoh Khafre. Dunn proposes that this similar method was inflicted by people who were seeking to obtain stone from Aswan or Giza long after the pyramids were constructed, that such methods would not have resulted in the incredibly precise structures that were erected long before. So how did the ancient Egyptians work with such hard igneous rocks? Dunn is quick to dismiss both lasers and levitation as options. He admits that he cannot speak authoritatively on the latter, but confidently states that as an engineer, he has failed to see any evidence in his trips to Egypt that lasers were used in cutting of rocks used to construct pyramids. I was very interested to read Dunn's opinion on this because lasers are a commonly fantastical proposition that you kind of see online. Dunn writes, Although the laser is a wonderful tool with many uses, its function as a cutting tool is limited to economically viable applications, such as cutting small holes in thin pieces of metal and refractory material. As a general purpose cutting tool, it cannot compete with the machining methods that were available before its inception. Dunn instead proposes the use of sophisticated sawing, lathing, and milling practices. He claims that some of what was studied by Flinders Petrie, who Dunn references to frequently throughout his book, is indicative of work that has been carried out on some sort of lathe. Dunn writes, There is also evidence of clearly defined lathe tool marks on some sarcophagi lids. Dunn proposes that perhaps we are looking in the wrong place for the answers. Instead of looking at what cut the rock, we should be indeed looking at what mechanisms were in place to guide those cutting tools. In his own words, he proposes, The methods used to cut the masonry for the Great Pyramid can be deduced from the marks they left behind on the stone. Dunn calls to attention stone artefacts that were examined by Flinders Petrie. He believes that these artefacts, quote, almost undeniably, end quote, indicate the presence of machine power in the construction process. It is shocking that Petrie's studies of the fragments have not attracted greater attention, for there is unmistakable evidence of machine tooling methods. It will probably surprise many people to know that the evidence proving that the ancient Egyptians used tools such as straight saws, circular saws, and even laves has been recognized for over a century. The lathe is the father of all machine tools in existence, and Petrie submitted evidence showing that the ancient Egyptians not only used lathes, but they performed tasks that would, by today's standards, be considered impossible without highly developed specialized techniques, tasks such as cutting concave and convex spherical radii without splintering the material. Dunn suggests that at the time of Petrie, the machining industry was in its infancy and people just didn't know what they were looking at, and therefore the evidence was overlooked at the time. On top of this, the Egyptology standpoint Dunn came up against was that the Egyptians used chisels to work their granite. Dunn calls this suggestion ridiculous. We covered the intense amount of effort and manpower it would take to have a constant fresh supply of copper chisels in my deep dive on the internal ramp theory. Dunn touches on the same points, indicating that the constant repairing and refreshing of copper chisels that would continually dull out and need replacing would just not be suitable. 
On top of that, Dunn suggests that regular copper is just simply not strong enough to work with granite. He says, even after being hardened, the copper is not capable of cutting granite. The hardest copper alloy in existence today is beryllium copper. There is no evidence to suggest that the ancient Egyptians possessed this alloy, but even if they did, even this alloy is not hard enough to cut granite. Yet copper has been described as the only metal available to the craftspeople building the Great Pyramid. Dunn, however, proposes that the Egyptians were knowledgeable in ironworking, and that copper was not the only metal that the pyramid builders had access to. The trouble with this is that outside of meteoric iron, which has been found used in tiny proportions, the only piece of iron ever discovered was a small plate that was found inside the Great Pyramid, in one of the King's Chamber shafts, no less, by one of the men of Colonel Howard Weiss's expedition. Now, Everything about this piece of iron is suspect. In fact, a video that I did that goes into all of the information around this piece of iron is, at the time of writing, my most popular video on this channel. If you're interested in that bizarre find, then I will link to that video in the description below. However, the conventional timeline of history shows us that ironworking did not come up until later, and that the ancient Egyptians did not have access to ironworking in order to produce enough iron in quantities that could be used for building or weaponry. Dunn uses the presence of this iron plate and the fact that the iron plate is often overlooked by many investigators to support that, well, if we found iron that predates the mainstream invention and proliferation of ironworking, then perhaps the ancient Egyptians had access to other metals too, and that we just don't know about it. This, for me, seems like a bit of a stretch, especially as I have investigated the iron plate and found that it is almost definitely not contemporary to the construction of the Great Pyramid, but we'll come back to that later. As Dunn himself says, however, without going back in time and interviewing the craftspeople who worked on the pyramids, we will never know for sure what materials their tools were made of. Any debate on this subject would be futile, for until the proof is at hand, we can reach no satisfactory conclusion. Quite right, I say. What Dunn instead proposes as a solution loops back to what we said earlier. Don't look at the tools. Look at the mechanisms used to guide the tools. For now, we will focus on the granite used inside the king's chamber, as Dunn proposes it holds all of the clues that we need to crack this mystery. In modern times, granite is cut with wire, which is covered with something such as silicon carbide, a material that shares a level of hardness with diamond, and can therefore cut through quartz-rich granite without much trouble. The abrasive wire is spun around at speed between two wheels, and the granite is pressed up against the wire and the cutting starts to take place fairly quickly. Dunn then takes the time to remind us that the wire is not cut in the granite, however, but the silicon carbide that is placed on the wire is doing all of the work. Now, referring back to the artifacts examined by Petrie, Dunn proposes that examples 3b and 5b, as shown here, are indicative of being cut using a similar method. The imprint from the wire is left in the rock. A wire saw is therefore a possible solution, for its operation need not be extremely complex. The next question then is if such saws were possibly used, were they powered by hand or by machine? Dunn is convinced that there is strong evidence for the latter. He proposes that small errors made when cutting the granite coffer in the king's chamber are indicative of machine tooling. Why? Well, in how these errors were noticed during the cutting process and how the builders addressed the correction of such errors was done in such a way that would be, uh, would be done by someone operating a high-powered saw. Those who would be cutting with a hand-powered saw would be cutting at a much slower and manually deliberate rate, that the error in the cut would be noticed and corrected earlier, and the final appearance, therefore, would be different. This is cross-referenced by observations made by Flinders Petrie of the same marks, and whilst I don't feel I've done Christopher Dunn's explanation much justice in this regard, I do think that he has a point. 
short of just copying and pasting four solid pages of quotations from both Dunn and Petrie into this section, I would instead suggest that you go and check the more technical detail of the operation for yourself. If you're curious, it's on pages 76 and 77 of the Giza Power Plant book, of which, too, there is an internet archive library link in the video description. Moreover, there is further evidence inside the same granite coffer, says Dunn, going back to the King's Chamber here. Dunn compares the potential method used to core out the granite here against modern procedures that do the same thing. Dunn writes, Tool marks on the coffers inside indicate that when the granite was hollowed out, workers made preliminary rough cuts by drilling holes into the granite around the area that was to be removed. Petrie himself addresses this, suggesting that tube drills were used to core holes into the granite and then the remainder was smashed loose, with the final surface being dressed by hand. There are errors inside too that confirm Dunn's points. Addressing a report from Petrie on the potential remains of a tube drill hole, Dunn writes, Once again, while working their drill into the granite, the machinists had made a mistake before they had time to correct it. So all this talk of lathes, saws, drills, this stuff could not have been possible without the wheel. This is a controversial one to approach, but Dunn does so in the following way. Although the ancient Egyptians are not given credit for the wheel, the fact is that archaeological evidence, when evaluated with a machinist's eye, proves that they not only had the wheel, but they used it in very sophisticated ways. One supposes that the machinist's eye to which he refers in this case is probably his own. I don't know, this isn't expanded on. This needs work, and this long sentence alone does not prove that the wheel existed in ancient Egypt. It's not strong enough to steamroll on with the rest of the theory, which is kind of what happens here for the first time, uh, in all fairness. Similarly, with the existence of lathes used by ancient Egyptians, Dunn claims that they have all disappeared nowadays, but refers to reports once more from Flinders Petrie, who gives evidence of lathe turning on pieces of diorolite, and uh, also on a bowl that has similar marks that indicate lathe work. Dunn claims to have discovered evidence of lathe turning when examining a sarcophagus lid at the Cairo Museum. There is a diagram of this lid provided in the book, which I will put on screen right now. Returning to the accounts of Petrie, Dunn takes evidence that Petrie recorded, that being what appeared to be marks left by tubular drills, undertaking a cutting process called trepanning. In a recurring theme here, where Petrie struggled to ascertain the meaning of such cutting techniques, Dunn, with the modern machinist technology and know-how, however, is able to provide a breakthrough. Taking this account and interpreting the marks left by the builder's drills, Dunn comes to the following conclusions, and I'll summarise here as we are kind of repeating ourselves from earlier discoveries. Dunn believes that the quote-unquote official chronology of metalworking is incorrect, and that the Egyptians had access to other elements other than just copper, but stops short of saying more at this point. Dunn also concludes that the markings indicate that the use of hand-turned drills is unlikely. This conclusion is made on the assumption that a hand-operated drill being removed from the material would not keep spinning and therefore leave the unusual marks that have been so heavily noted. The author writes, In my opinion, the application of ultrasonic machining is the only method that completely satisfies logic from a technical viewpoint and explains all noted phenomena. What follows is an in-depth explanation with diagrams of how ultrasonic drilling works, which is probably beyond the scope of this video if I'm honest, but the overview here is that the marks left on the granite and previously analysed by explorers such as Flinders Petrie are taken as evidence for advanced machine-driven working of materials and not the quote-unquote primitive methods that are proposed by Egyptologists. In Dunn's own words, it goes without saying that further studies need to be done. Personally, I couldn't agree more. As detailed as this section of the book is, and as feasible as the propositions around cutting stone may be, admittedly the book does lose me a bit when it comes to lathes and ultrasonic drill. Maybe I'm showing my narrow-mindedness, but in my mind's eye I just cannot see it. Also, aside from his personal interpretation of cutting marks on stone, there is absolutely zero evidence that such machines ever existed. The pyramids endure, but not a single morsel of physical evidence for any of this incredibly complex and advanced machinery can be found. Chapter 5 covers Dunn's visit to Giza, with our favourite authors Robert Boval and Graham Hancock. Here, the principles discussed previously are applied on the ground as the author traverses several sites around Giza. 
The main conclusion of all of this is that whilst hard proof does not exist due to the precise nature of the construction of what has been left behind, we cannot deny that these tools did in fact exist. Dunn writes that if someone was looking back on our civilization from some faraway future, they too would perhaps not be able to find all of the boring behind the scenes nuts and bolts details of what went on in our current lifetime. He also makes the example of an ancient stone mural, something that is often created on purpose for future generations to see, something that conveys an ideological message rather than preserve any contemporary technology. Rounding this section out, Dunn writes, Even though the Egyptian tools and machines have not survived the thousands of years since their use, we have to assume, by objective analysis of the evidence for them left behind in the artefacts, that these tools did indeed exist. Again, a nice thought, and one that closes off the study thus far nicely, but I don't think I'm being unreasonable with my insistence that some actual evidence, even circumstantial, would, be greatly, would greatly benefit this argument and give it the credit that it perhaps deserves. This is where the book enters into a, a transitional phase from one theory into the other. The author proposes that in order to work with such advanced tools, there must have been an equally advanced energy system to support such work. And thus the seed for the Giza power plant is uh, planted. <laughs> there is, of course, like this advanced machine tool industry that we just discussed, zero evidence of ancient Egyptian power plants ever having been found. Or is there? Perhaps we are looking for power plants with our modern eyes, and perhaps the power plants of the past look totally different from what we would expect, and that they are right under our noses. Now, I have a problem with this statement, I'm sorry to say, because we've just spent half the book being convinced that we need to use our modern technological eyes in order to see the evidence that Petrie and others failed to correctly interpret, and now we are being asked to do the exact opposite. It may just be a throwaway line to emphasize that it was pyramids that were the power plants all along, but one that lands incredibly awkwardly because from this point onwards we will once again be returning to applying modern scientific discoveries and processes to buildings that are over 4,000 years old. So yeah, a very strange thing to say, bang in the middle of a book, but hey, there's always a chance that I've just interpreted it incorrectly. This definitely stuck out to me as a bizarre statement, however, because I also highlighted it on my first read-through several weeks ago. But anyway, on with the show, as it were. Dunn writes, In light of all the evidence that suggests the existence of a highly advanced society utilizing electricity in prehistory, I began to seriously consider the possibility that the pyramids were the power plants of the ancient Egyptians. For me, this puts us in a very strange chicken and egg situation. Which came first? The pyramids that powered the machine tools, or the machine tools that built the pyramids? Dunn recounts studying the chambers of the Great Pyramid, and becoming convinced that he was looking at the blueprints of a giant machine. I have to admit that I too had very similar thoughts when I first saw the inside of the Great Pyramid, especially when I first matched those diagrams up to pictures of the King's Chamber, which has such a stark, almost industrial feel to it. So let's get into the meat of this power plant business. It all starts with seismic energy from inside the Earth itself, the same kind of energy that causes earthquakes and all that horrible stuff. There's a lot of detail at this point about the different types of seismic energy waves, the frequency of the pulse of the Earth and the Schumann resonance, all of which builds up to the design of the pyramid being in such a way and in such a place, in such location, as to uh, be able to draw upon this energy and release it, become in tune with it and even harness it. In regards to the Great Pyramid's exact position and design, Dunn recounts ways in which the pyramid has been found to be in, quote, close association with the earth, end quote. Taken individually, these pieces of evidence could each be passed off as coincidence, but Dunn argues they may have been part of a wider plan. The first is that the pyramid sits at a location that is supposedly at the centre of the earth's landmass. Secondly, we touch on some of the sketchier aspects of the pi correlation around the pyramid, that being that the Great Pyramid's perimeter is analogous with the circumference of the Earth. Here we are quoted the workings of one John Taylor, who came to such conclusions, but arguing for or against the evidence of this, I will reserve for another video. Let's just include it here in the list of supported evidence for now. From these points... Dunn draws two possible outcomes for building the pyramid in such a way. One is that the pyramid builders wanted to demonstrate somehow that they had knowledge of the circumference of the entire planet. The other is that the planet somehow directly interacted with the function of the pyramid. So, 
Is it possible that the pyramid was designed to draw off energy that would otherwise result in earthquakes and the like, and instead use that energy for something worthwhile? Dunn takes this moment to clarify the difference between resonance and harmonics. Resonance is a sympathetic vibration of one object with another, he writes. He suggests that the pyramid may have contained the apparatus to allow it to become a coupled oscillator. That is, becoming one with the vibration within the Earth and its harmonic frequencies. For clarity's sake, Dunn's explanation of a coupled oscillator is as follows. A coupled oscillator is an object that is in harmonic resonance with another usually larger vibrating object. When set into motion, the coupled oscillator will draw energy from the source and vibrate in sympathy as long as the source continues to vibrate. Dunn states that because the Earth produces a large spectrum of different frequencies, vibration can be tapped and captured as a source of energy with the right technology. To quote him directly once more, he writes, Knowing that the Great Pyramid is a mathematical integer of the Earth, it may not be so outlandish to propose that the pyramid is capable of vibrating at harmonic frequency of the Earth's fundamental frequency. We return now to the work of acoustics engineer Tom Danley, who was the subject of my previous video on the supposed secret tunneling inside the Great Pyramid in the first chamber above the King's Chamber. Tom was there to carry out some acoustic tests when he noticed an additional tunnel being dug out, but right now we're going to focus on the tests that he carried out. Oddly, Dunn claims that Danley is, or was, under a non-disclosure agreement about the tests that he was doing inside the Great Pyramid. This was complicated by the fact that Danley had gone public about potential secret digging, but Dunn proposes that Danley may have discovered, quote, the sound of the earth itself, but is he not allowed to tell, question mark. Along this line of thinking, Dunn also mentions the placing of a fan in the southern king's chamber shaft, as well as a tunnel being dug into the northern shaft to place additional equipment. He seems to indicate that this may have deliberately been done to stop the blowing on a coke bottle effect that the King's Chamber had previously to this, but we know that the tunnel was excavated by Giovanni Caviglia, possibly at the same time as he also potentially dug the Man Killer Tunnel at the other end of the King's Chamber Northern Shaft. I will link a video I've made about that too if anyone is interested. The coke bottle effect is called a Helmholtz resonator and we'll touch on it further in the video. We now call back to a video I did right at the start of the channel about musician Paul Horn, who recorded an album inside the Great Pyramid. The album is a loose collection of flute pieces that utilizes the unique acoustics in multiple chambers. Horn is brought up in the Giza Power Plant book because he used a Korg tuner to check the frequency of the inside of the King's Chamber. Dunn did a similar test with a matrix tuner, reporting a reading somewhere between 4 through 9 hertz and 440 hertz that was achieved by striking the granite coffer with his hand. Dunn also reported discovering strange acoustic phenomena during one of his trips to the King's Chamber. Dunn had a discussion with Stephen Mailer, the director of the research at the Kinnaman Foundation, and was put in touch with Robert Vorter, another acoustics engineer. After analysing some tape of a recording from inside the King's Chamber, Vorta claimed that, quote, the King's Chamber was designed specifically as a resonant chamber in which sound of specific frequencies would resonate. There are indeed strange acoustic properties to the King's Chamber. As far back as Howard Weiss, there were reports of him being able to hear people talking inside the subterranean chamber whilst he was in the King's Chamber far above them. Much esoteric and, uh, how should I say, New Age meaning has been appropriated to the various anomalies with the acoustics in the Great Pyramid, particularly the King's Chamber. This could be as innocuous as, well, it's a giant rectangular room made out of hundreds of tons of polished granite stone rich with quartz. How can it not possess interesting acoustic properties? Anyway, this acoustic information is important because taken along with the work that Dunn undertook pulling together the various aspects of the pyramid size and dimensions and the clarification of resonance versus harmonics, yada yada yada, he is about to drop the first bombshell regarding how the Giza power plant theory actually works. He writes, 
covering a large land area, the Great Pyramid is in fact in harmonic resonance with the vibration of the Earth, a structure that could act as an acoustical horn for collecting, channeling and or focusing terrestrial vibration. We are led to consider, therefore, that energy associated with the pyramid shape is not drawn from the air or magically generated simply by the geometric form of a pyramid, but the pyramid acts as a receiver of energy from within the Earth itself. Now, in the following pages, Dunn addresses the pyramid power phenomenon. This is indeed a section of the book that has not aged well at all. We are talking about mummification um, and the preservation of fruits and vegetables, about the sharpening of blades by using the pyramid shape. So what's all this about pyramid power, then? Ah, my esteemed dress bedecked one. The pyramids are mystic centers of great power. Within them, time is slowed or time is sped. And they also sharpen hamburger and keep razor blades fresh. Aha! I'm going to skirt over this whole section because, well, hopefully that's clear for obvious reasons. It doesn't actually affect the theory in any way, to be fair. It just seems to be included here as a kitchen sink approach to the strangeness around the properties of the pyramid shape and sound. We then go deeper into a portion about Tesla, which I will also exclude here for the same reasons. There's plenty of rubbish on the internet linking Tesla to the pyramids already, and I do not want to contribute to it. The long and short of it all is that the Great Pyramid acts as a coupled oscillator with the tectonic or seismic energy source that it draws from the earth. But how does the pyramid harness that energy? Enter chapter 9 then, which took me right back to GCSE electronics. First we must understand the concept of what a transducer is. Let's quote the first thing that comes up on a Google search, and uh, what most people searching online for that question would actually realistically see. Wikipedia then says, a transducer is a device that converts energy from one form to another. Usually a transducer converts a signal in one form of energy to a signal in another. I can feel the comments brewing now about how Wikipedia is an awful source, and in many ways that is correct, but the definition of transducer is pretty spot on, to be fair. Now, chapter 9 of Chris Dunn's book is called The Mighty Crystal. This immediately makes me think back to, you know being a little kid playing Crash Bandicoot 3, having to plunge into the death traps of that game's ancient Egyptian levels to collect sparkly purple crystals. However, the crystal that Dunn is referring to is the quartz inside the granite stone that makes up the king's chamber. Dunn writes, Let me make no apology for the theory I am proposing. The Great Pyramid was a geomechanical power plant that responded sympathetically with the Earth's vibrations and converted that energy into electricity. They used the electricity to power their civilization, which included machine tools with which they shaped hard, igneous rock. That is to say, then, that the King's Chamber itself is a great big transducer. It takes the energy from the Earth and converts it into usable power. But we are skipping ahead slightly here. Let's look at the makeup of the King's Chamber and the so-called relieving chambers above it. Dan explains that the rough topmost surfaces of the beams of each relieving chamber as being this way due to them being tuned by stonemasons to give off the exact correct frequency for resonance. Dunn also claims that the king's chamber floor sits on corrugated rock. This was supposedly confirmed by Tom Downley's acoustic tests, the same ones that he also supposedly is not allowed to talk about. Writes Dunn, there are pockets beneath the floor that indicate that the support for the floor is corrugated like an egg carton, with the flooring sitting on nodes. In addition, the walls of the chamber do not sit on the granite floor, but are supported from the outside and sunk five inches below floor level. The whole complex is freestanding from the limestone masonry, has minimal dampening on the floor, and is thus free to vibrate at peak efficiency. Okay, so how did the energy vibrating out of the earth get into the king's chamber? How do we feed that raw seismic energy into a workable form and funnel it up to oscillate the king's chamber granite? Turning to the grand gallery, Dunn has us first examine the ceiling, writing. It has been assumed that the ratchet-style ceiling in the grand gallery was so designed to prevent an accumulation of forces bearing down the angle of the gallery and pressing on the lower pieces. Yet other angled passages in the Great Pyramid, such as the ascending and descending passages, have flat ceilings. So I am left to conclude that this feature was indeed specifically designed for an acoustical purpose. Now, this, in my opinion, is a stretch. 
In the previous section on the relieving chambers, Dunn tells the often repeated but fully incorrect fact that the relieving chambers serve no purpose at all and are just holding up dead air above the king's chamber. This is, of course, not true. The chambers, regardless of the intricacies of the design, raise the gabled ceiling of the king's chamber far above the grand gallery so that the reflecting forces are not passed into the neighbouring structure, as in the forces of the weight of the pyramid above. There is a similar purpose for the design of the Grand Gallery ceiling, which is angled in such a way to relieve pressure on the lower parts of the stones. As we just read in the previous quote, Dunn dismisses this because the ascending and descending passages are not designed in this way. For a start, these passages are not comparable. A large portion of the descending passage is actually cut from the bedrock beneath the pyramid. Also, neither of those passages are as large or as challenging a construction as the mass and mind-boggling grand gallery. Both are also lower in the pyramid. I'm no structural engineer, as I'm sure you can tell, but I feel it is wrong to dismiss the design of the grand gallery ceiling so flippantly in this way. So what of the grand gallery then? Dunn proposes this long, odd-shaped room housed the apparatus that supposedly turned the vibrational energy from within the earth into tangible airborne sound. The sound would then be fed into the king's chamber, which would create electricity. But let's keep things in the grand gallery for a moment. Dunn writes... The mysteries of the 27 pairs of slots in the side ramps is logically explained if we theorize that each pair of slots contained a resonator assembly and the slots served to lock these assemblies into place. On top of the slots, Dunn proposes a design for these resonators that also explains the existence of the groove cut along the cobbled wall of the Grand Gallery as shown in these lovely little diagrams. As for why none of these frames mounted into the walls and holding these resonators have survived, uh, Dan explains that they most likely were made of wood, uh, which goes some way to offering a reason for their complete and total absence. But what of the resonators themselves? Perhaps the tens of thousands of pots then that were found beneath the step pyramid, which we have covered briefly in another video. Perhaps these are the remaining resonators, stockpiled for use in many power stations? Dunn provides diagrams of how these resonators could have been machined into shape, comparing them to schist balls such as the one found in the Cairo Museum. What then of the antechamber between the King's Chamber and the Grand Gallery? What could its purpose be in the Giza power plant theory? Dunn proposes that it works more or less as physically intended, but it is an acoustic filter rather than a series of doors intended to seal off a tomb forever. The author proposes that the slabs, when lowered, acted as baffles to only let certain frequencies of sound generated in the Grand Gallery into the King's Chamber. This effectively increases the output of the system within the King's Chamber as it can work most optimally with the frequencies that best resonate with the granite and the quartz. Anything else can hopefully be mitigated by the baffles in the antechamber. Dunn next addresses how the pyramid does not shake itself apart trying to process all of this vibrational seismic energy it is converting into sound. Now, outside of stopping the vibrations coming into the pyramid or reversing the uh, coupling process between the two things in resonance, that being the pyramid and the earth itself, um, I'm not going to lie, I don't understand what that means and I'm not going to explain, it's not explained further. The only other option to stop the pyramid vibrating itself into rubble apparently, is to put a system in place that cancels out excess sound waves. This is achieved, Dunn says, by using an out-of-phase interface sound wave. Now, respectfully, this confused the hell out of me, I'll be honest. There's a page or two of this where the paragraphs are so dense, it felt like my eyes were going to melt out of my skull uh, the number of times I had to reread it. All I can say to you, and I, I won't pretend to understand it and make a fool out of myself, is that the granite plugs in the ascending passage are somehow used to offset this potential pyramid-destroying runway vibration. To be fair to Dunn, he does go deep on how this works, but for the first time in this channel's history, I'm just looking at the page and struggling how to accurately explain to you how this works in video form. Thankfully, how the Great Pyramid generates sound from Hemholtz resonators being fed with seismic energy from within the Earth without shaking itself to pieces is not a question that is asked of me all that often, so I think I'll get away with omitting this one section. As I've mentioned a few times now, if you want to go deeper again, you can borrow the book digitally from the archive.org library link in the video description. The passage in question, 
not the ascending passage, <laughs> the passage in the book is on page 177, which I have colourfully annotated to highlight my own confusion in my own copy as shown on screen. Chapter 10 then brings with it a welcome breath of clarity, where the entire work in premise of the Giza power plant theory is summed up in a single sentence. In this power plant, the vibrations from the earth cause oscillations of the granite within the king's chamber, and this vibrating mass of igneous quartz-bearing rock influences the gaseous medium contained within the chamber. Job done. Let's all get a cup of tea. What's that, Chris? No? Why? First, we must look at the evidence for the technology that utilised this gas. Okay, let's do that then, shall we? So Dunn explains that in order for this whole system to work and to really maximize the output of such a design, the atoms comprising the gas medium of the chambers in the Great Pyramid must have a natural frequency that resonates in harmony with the entire system. Make sense? No, let's dig a little deeper. Dunn writes, to be more accurate, the resonance of the chamber, which can be adjusted, should resonate in harmony with the frequency of hydrogen, which does not change. Under these conditions, the hydrogen atoms would more efficiently absorb the energy generated within the chamber. Confused? Well, chapter 10 brings masers into the equation. Not to be confused with, of course, the laser. The maser, if I get my A-level chemistry head on, or is that A-level physics? Help! <laughs> is described nicely in this little diagram on screen right now. MASER, Dunn explains, is an acronym of microwave amplification through stimulated emission radiation. In the diagram on screen right now, we can see the three stages of the microwave amplifier in this example. On this maser setup, Dunn has the following to say. In the Great Pyramid, there is evidence that strongly indicates that the ancient Egyptian engineers and designers knew about and utilized the principles of a maser to collect the energy that was being drawn through the pyramid from the earth and deliver it to the outside. This evidence can be found in the king's chamber. So what evidence does he speak of here? Let's look at a picture of what is supposedly going on just to get our heads into the right space. Energy comes into the chamber in the form of sound. This is vibrational energy from the earth which has been translated into sound forms by the Hemholtz resonators lined up in the Grand Gallery. Also coming into the King's Chamber via the northern shaft is the signal input of the three-stage microwave amplifier. We'll come back to this in a second. Let's also not forget that there is hydrogen gas in here too. Remember that we made mentioned hydrogen just now in regards to its resonance with the sound waves coming into the chamber. We haven't addressed where that gas is coming from yet because for some reason it seems like this theory is written backwards. But anyways, what happens when you cram this energy as sound into the chamber along with the hydrogen and this apparent input signal from the King's Chamber Northern Shaft? Well, Dan writes, sound roaring through the passageway at the resonant frequency of this chamber or its harmonic at sufficient amplitude would drive these granite beams to vibrate in resonance. With the granite beams vibrating at their resonant frequency, the sound energy would be converted through the piezoelectric effect of the silicon quartz crystals embedded in the granite, creating high frequency radio waves. This is where Dunn loses me again. Atomic hydrogen emissions from outer space have filtered into the pyramid via the King's Chamber Northern Shaft as part of a waveguide in this whole process. Dunn's explanation of a waveguide confused the living daylights out of me, so this is what Wikipedia says a waveguide is. A waveguide is a structure that guides waves by restricting the transmission of energy to one direction. Common types of waveguides include acoustic waveguides which direct sound, optical waveguides which direct light, and radio frequency waveguides which direct electromagnetic waves other than light, like radio waves. Okay, so returning to Dunn's theory, he suggests that the original smooth casing stones of the Great Pyramid were designed in such a way to capture these atomic hydrogen emissions for feeding down into the King's Chamber via the northern shaft. He proposes some figures that link the wavelength of microwave energy to the dimensions of the shaft before proposing that the entire shaft was lined with gold-plated iron. Out of all the far-fetched ideas we've had in this video, this struck me as one of the most far-fetched, I suppose, because it's so easily disproved. We looked at the iron plate that was supposedly found in the northern shaft in a previous video. The report of gold being a part of the iron's makeup was also inconclusive. The test performed to reach that conclusion have been called into question, and a second set of tests performed on the same piece of iron found absolutely zero trace of gold. 
Likewise, you would need a lot of iron and gold to plate the entire shaft, all of which is again nowhere to be found. Either way, with this input signal coming down this gold or not gold plated shaft, the mingling hydrogen and deafening sound roaring around the king's chamber would be picked up and pushed out to the southern shaft, at the base of which is a horn antenna. Exiting the pyramid via the southern shaft is a usable, harnessable power source. We will come back to what happens at this stage in a short while, but for now, we need to take a look at where the hydrogen gas comes from and why. This takes us into chapter 11 and down into the Queen's chamber. Here Dunn proposes that the infamous shaft system was used to introduce chemicals into the main chamber in order to produce hydrogen via a chemical reaction. He proposes hydrated zinc chloride and a dilute solution of hydrochloric acid were introduced to the Queen's chamber in order to facilitate such a reaction. Dunn puts forward his evidence for the Queen's Chamber being used for chemical reactions. He mentions Piazza Smith's account of having noticed flaked white mortar, seemingly calcium sulphide, exuding from the stone joints, as well as the account of the Queen's Chamber having a constant foul odour within it in times of antiquity. On top of that, we have the well-documented salt incrustations found in the chamber as well as along the horizontal passage, which was reportedly up to half an inch thick in some places, Dunn perceives these reports as evidence of chemical reactions having taken place in the chamber. Dunn proposes the existence of salt shows that the Queen's chamber was meant to take in fluids rather than air via the shaft systems. The well-known humidity problem that existed within the Great Pyramid is omitted here, unfortunately. And it is the reason why Gantabrink installed the fan in the Southern King's chamber shaft, as well as the air conditioning system in the excavation made by Cavilia alongside the King's chamber northern shaft. Granted, over-tourism was contributing massively to the humidity issue, but anyone who has had problems of this nature, or perhaps damp or water ingress issues at home, will know that water or moisture will push salts out of stone. Personally, I'd say that humidity was far more likely the cause for the salt issues, but let's see what else Dunn has to stay here. A study of the properties of the salt carried out by Dr. Patrick Flanagan of the Arizona Bureau of Geology and Mineral Technology found that the chemical makeup of the salt, I won't list it all here, is exactly what would be expected to be produced by the reaction of hydrogen gas coming into contact with the limestone of the Queen's Chamber. He attributes the salt buildup, tapering off the further along the horizontal passage that you get to the Grand Gallery, is because you are getting further away from the chemical reaction that is happening inside the Queen's Chamber. So in short, chemicals are introduced to the Queen's Chamber via the shafts, they mix and release hydrogen. This can float up into the Grand Gallery and into the King's Chamber, where it mixes with the sound forms created by the Grand Gallery's resonators to create usable energy. This runoff then of the spent chemicals travels from the queen's chamber down the horizontal passage and down the conveniently placed well shaft at the bottom of the grand gallery as for the foul smell in the queen's chamber dunn attributes this to hydrogen sulfide a gas formed by combining sulfur and hydrogen Oddly enough, Dunn himself had not been able to investigate the Queen's Chamber when writing the Giza power plant, as his visit coincided with the French team that was digging into the horizontal passageway walls after it was revealed potential cavities existed behind there. These cavities turned out to be filled with a certain type of quartz sand. This is not included in the Giza power plant theory in any way. In fact, it is actively dismissed as being, quote, only sand. As for the shafts entering the Queen's Chamber originally being hidden or sealed behind stone, this was a deliberate design choice to regulate the slower flow of chemicals into the chamber. Dunn argues the small cracks would instead meter the chemicals into the chambers. Our attention now turns to the often covered doors. At the time of Dunn's writing, door, singular, that was discovered by Rudolf Gantenbrink and his team in 1993. Of much discussion is, of course, what appears to be two metal pins protruding from each door. Dunn proposes that, in the case of the southern shaft, these are electrodes that would have measured the level of hydrochloric acid solution which would have been delivered to the chamber below. The author proposes that the hook found in the shaft broke off a flotation system that signalled when the shaft was full of fluid, as shown in these handy and clear diagrams. The hook would make contact with the electrodes and shut off the supply of fluid. 
When the level of fluid in the shaft dropped enough so that the hook broke away from the electrodes, this would signal for the system to feed more hydrochloric acid solution into the shaft. The fluid comes from a proposed vertical shaft that connects directly to a chamber in the bedrock deep beneath the pyramid. Whilst there are some fantastical whispers of what lays beyond or below Gandenbrink's door, especially from the time when the discovery of the doors was fresh and new and had everybody talking, but there is no further mention of this supposed vertical shaft. Tom Danley, of whose acoustic tests we are not allowed to speak of, managed to use an acoustic device to send a signal beyond Gantenbrink's door, where it is claimed that the readings indicated that the sound went on for another 30 feet before bouncing back to source. We know, of course, that this is completely not true, or his device was giving him some sort of wacky reading as the door was drilled through, eventually revealing a very small space, definitely much smaller than 30 feet in length. So this does drop excrement on this part of the theory from a, a very great height. Dunn references John Carousel. I apologize if I am uh, butchering that name. Can't get through a video without butchering someone's name. A French engineer, right, whose team discovered a supposed corridor running beneath the horizontal entrance to the subterranean chamber. So hear me out. The team also proposed a vertical anomaly connecting to said corridor as well as a deep chamber potentially beneath it. Dunn takes all of this as evidence for his fluid feeding system for the Queen's Chamber shafts. Carousel's team made these conclusions after studying with microgravimetrics and ground-penetrating radar. All we have here is a referenced extract of the book co-authored by Robert Bovall and Graham Hancock, in which Carousel is referenced, so this is third-hand information. I'm very interested in these supposed discoveries, and we'll do some digging into these in the future, but for now, that's beyond the video scope, so let's soldier on and pull all of this together as best we can. Outside of a section on a proposed meltdown, which takes up the entirety of chapter 12, we have more or less covered the elements of the Giza power plant theory in its entirety. Chapter 12 covers the damage in the King's Chamber, as well as brings the well shaft grotto into play, but this video is long enough already without me opening any more cans of worms. If there is interest, of course, I will, gov I will cover the Giza power plant meltdown, as well as Dunn's series of speculative appendices that appear at the end of the book. But I've already struggled quite heavily to squeeze any tangible evidence out of a lot of this theory, especially as it goes on. Chapter 13 then offers us a recap to everything we have just processed. So let's do just that before we think of bringing everything to a close. Here Dunn writes, Facilitated by the elements that fuel our sun, hydrogen, and uniting the energy of the universe with that of the earth, the ancient Egyptians converted vibrational energy into microwave energy. Here's the final diagram of the entire pyramid, with all the chambers and shafts labelled for their use in the theory. Dunn proposes that the apparatus that primed the pyramid's connection with the seismic energy coming from the Earth was most likely kept in the subterranean chamber. There's also a bit about the three smaller satellite pyramids at Giza being spun up first, and their combined power along with this apparatus could give the massive jolt to get the Great Pyramid in sync with the Earth's seismic energy like some sort of giant bloody lawnmower. The pumping system, of which we cannot see, even if they exist at all, kick into action, Fill in the shafts of the Queen's Chamber with chemical solutions, hydrochloric acid solutions in the southern shaft and hydrated zinc chloride in the northern shaft. These are filtered into the so-called Queen's Chamber, where they react to create hydrogen gas. The waste chemicals run down the horizontal passageway and exit via the well shaft, which was once connected perhaps to some sort of further tunnel system or waterway. The created hydrogen from the Queen's Chamber travels along the same horizontal corridor as the waste chemical, but instead rises through the Grand Gallery and into the so-called King's Chamber. The Earth's seismic energy, now emanating up through the Great Pyramid, is captured by the array of resonators in the Grand Gallery, which act as a series of transducers, converting the raw energy from the Earth into a tangible sound form. This roaring wall of sound is pushed into the antechamber, where it is acoustically filtered, so only the frequency that allows the harmonic resonance between the created sound and the quartz-rich granite chamber were allowed inside. These intense but controlled vibrations result in in piezoelectric energy, a combination of both acoustic and electromagnetic energy. The hydrogen gas pumped up from the Queen's Chamber absorbs that energy. 
The metal lined northern shaft of the king's chamber, bringing in as a waveguide the microwave signal needed to carry this usable energy out of the pyramid, hits an apparent crystal box amplifier. Read sarcophagus. The next bit, which is where the magic happens, I will leave to Dunn. The process built exponentially, occurring trillions of times over. What entered the chamber as a low energy signal became a collimated parallel beam of immense power as it was collected in a microwave receiver housed in the southern wall of the king's chamber and was then directed through the metal line southern shaft to the outside of the pyramid. And that's it folks, you may have seen it talked about online, well, that's the deep dive on the full workings of the Giza power plant. Dunn drums up some muster to round out the theory, stating, When we know what to look for, we cannot ignore the evidence of advanced methods of machining. I hope this fact alone will persuade those working in the fields of archaeology and hydrotology to take another look at this material. The evidence presented in this book, for the most part, was recorded many years ago by men of integrity who worked in the fields of archaeology and Egyptology. That much of this evidence was misunderstood only reveals the pressing need for an interdisciplinary approach to fields that have until recently been closed to non-academics and others outside of the fold of formal archaeology and Egyptology. To me, these two statements only truly truly represent one thing and that is and there is no way for me to say this without sounding a bit harsh but these statements act as a catch-all disclaimer for the enormous amount of lacking evidence when it comes to proving any of this stuff actually happened passing the burden of collecting evidence to people like petrie and piatti smith and the like is well it's not great the uh, they didn't know what they were looking at argument only goes so far, and most of it is arbitrary detail for various trivial aspects of the Great Pyramid. None of these accounts amount to an interpretation of evidence that leads to even a remote possibility that the Great Pyramid was a power plant. On top of this, Dunn's own evidence doesn't really offer anything new, and in the sections on machine tooling, much of what he is writing about once more links back to what was previously discovered by Flinders Petrie. Dunn, no doubt, has a brilliant mind and a sharp eye for interpreting what he sees with a machinist's mindset. He also is a methodical and engaging writer who unsurprisingly writes even the most fantastical proposition as a stark scientific to the point declaration. He is clearly passionate about the work being presented to us here, but he does not let that overtake the dry methodical engineering lens through which he views his entire theory. But just like the Egyptologists he accuses of being blinded by their own worldview, Dunn unfortunately falls into the same trap that he has set for himself. He is seeing everything from a machinist perspective, looking for advanced and complex reasoning in every aspect of the Great Pyramid, and especially when we get to some of the wilder propositions. We are taking what little evidence we do have, the same evidence gathered by greats such as Petrie, and shoehorning it to fit a theory which is little in the way of any contemporary study to back it up. Whatever you make of Dunn's work, and I have thoroughly enjoyed this book, I'll be honest with you, there is not enough evidence here to convince me that the Giza power plant ever existed. I will always keep an open mind. I will always watch Christopher Dunn as he crops up online for talks, and I will read his book, his books and his releases as they come out. There is a new book coming soon, in fact, but as for now, machine tooling, I'm on the fence. Giza power plant, it's a no from me. I'm struggling to find online detractors of Dunn's work, at least outside of the social media and YouTube comment section sphere, wherein, of course, there are just as many people singing his praises as they are criticizing his theory. Perhaps this, in turn, is related to the lack of evidence. If there's nothing to argue against, then how can one construct a counter-argument? So instead, I will leave you with the final word uh, on the matter from Zahi Oas, who is a controversial figure in his own right, to say the least. In an article for Egypt Independent, Oas states the following in regards to the Giza power plant and other controversial pyramid theories. I have studied and discussed all these views in a scientific manner with real evidence and I have not found any scientific studies that give credibility to these views. There is no linguistic or archaeological evidence indicating that pyramids were power plants. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an interesting ride. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing to the channel. As always, let me know what you think in the comment section and let's have a discussion about this topic. I'm Sean, this is Lines in Sand and I'll catch you in the next one.
All the best. <laughs>